Hello, and welcome to the NEA's webinar series, Creative Placemaking Now. Our town panelists speak about current trends, challenges, and policies. In July 2012, the NEA is hosting three webinars to talk with experts in creative placemaking about current trends, challenges, policies in the field. These experts all served on the Our Town Program grant review panels. I'm going to start with a brief presentation, and then we'll jump into speaking with our panelists for about 30 minutes. That'll leave about 15 to 20 minutes for, for questions from the public. Today, we're going to be speaking about creative placemaking through design and cultural planning. Before we get started, a few housekeeping details. You are all muted and will only be able to hear myself and the panelists. During the presentation, at any point, you can submit questions or comments using the Q&A box below the PowerPoint. We will do our best to address as many as possible during the time we, we have. Please do not use the raise hand button. This webinar will be posted on our website in the podcasts, webcasts, and webinars section for a few days, in a few days, so you can refer to it in the future. So what is creative placemaking? It's when partners from public, private, nonprofit, and community sectors strategically shape the physical and social character of a neighborhood, town, tribe, city, or region around arts and cultural activities. While we support creative placemaking at the NEA through a number of different programs and partnerships, our town is the agency's primary grant program with the sole focus on creative placemaking. Now in its second year, our town will contribute to sparking creative placemaking across the country with grants that increase the livability of communities and help transform them into lively, beautiful, and sustainable places with the arts at their core. Just a brief reminder that our town grants are partnership projects. They require a partnership between a local government and an arts organization. This partnership is one of the real innovations of these grants, as we've heard from communities all across the country that the Our Town guidelines have encouraged interesting and fruitful conversations at the local level. In 2011, the first round of Our Town grants funded 51 projects in 34 states. Most of these projects are deep into their work and we look forward to getting their final reports over the next six months or so to begin program evaluation. In FY12, after receiving 317 applications, we're funding 80 grants for just under $5 million in 44 states plus DC. In the first two years, we will have funded all 50 states plus the District of Columbia, with communities doing creative placemaking from the edge of Alaska to the tip of Florida. I'm going to briefly run through some statistics about this year's Our Town grants. Let's look at some population data first. Here's how the grants break down by community size. You'll note there's a real mix of communities of all sizes. Including the two leads, this year's Our Town grants have 566 partners. That's an incredible number and represents the depth and strength of partnerships that they have in their communities. Of these partners, 192 of them are arts or design organizations, 44 are local arts agencies, and four are states arts agencies. When we break down those 192 arts organization partners, you can see that we have all disciplines in the grants with theater, museums, visual arts, and multidisciplinary organizations having a large presence. I know you're all asking yourself, who are those other 362 partners on the grants? Well, it's a wide variety of nonprofit organizations, educational institutions at all levels, government agencies from the state, local, and federal level, including the Army, private enterprises, and other organizations like BIDS, Chambers of Commerce, and private philanthropy. The diversity of this list is both amazing and exciting to us. Look at all the different types of organizations who are now contributing to arts projects in their communities. And finally, let's look at some project types. You'll note that public art and the design of facilities and public space is very popular among grantees. But there's also a large number of engagement projects, arts programming, festivals, and performances, for example. Based on our experience last year, 
We decided to do the panel process a bit differently and break the grants into three panels. First, we held a non-metro panel. We spoke about these grants in the last webinar. This panel included applications received from non-metropolitan communities with projects in arts engagement, design, and cultural planning. Today, we're going to have folks from the design and cultural planning panel. They review projects from metropolitan communities that are develop developing local support systems and places necessary for creative placemaking to succeed. Lastly, we held an arts engagement panel. We'll be talking to those folks next week. They reviewed projects from metropolitan communities where artistic production is the primary method of creative placemaking. As I said before, the Design and Cultural Planning panel reviewed around 100 projects from metropolitan communities. These included projects in creative asset mapping, master planning for cultural districts, creative industries, and creative entrepreneurship. Design projects from this panel involve the design of artist space, cultural facilities, and public spaces for cultural engagement. We gave 26 grants to, to these communities from all across the country. Some examples of the types of projects we're funding are the Schematic Design for the Harmony Initiative, a new facility designed by La Dolman Architects, which will create space and integrate programming for three organizations, the Milwaukee Ballet, the Peck School of the Arts, and the w Wisconsin College of Sports Medicine. We're also funding projects like cultural district plans in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Long Beach Island, New Jersey, and Beverly, Massachusetts, artist space planning in Dearborn, Michigan, and Cleveland, Ohio, cultural facility planning and design in St. Paul, Minnesota, and Grand Forks, creative business incubator designs in Flagstaff, Arizona, and Overland Park, Kansas, and the redesign of infrastructure to be excellent in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and Medford, Oregon. That's not all. There's some other unique projects, like the Street of Dreams project in Omaha, Nebraska. It involves the redesign of a key square in a neighborhood into a festival square, a place for the arts, but also will engage the renowned visual artist and urban planner Theaster Gates to transform a nearby vacant building into central space for artists, residents, featuring studios, exhibition space, performance, and community spaces. With all that in mind, let's jump into our conversation. Let me first introduce our panelists. Daniel Hernandez, who's based in New York City, is the director of Jonathan Rose Company's Urban Solutions Planning Practice. He has more than 20 years of experience as a real estate developer and planner. Hernandez combines his deep expertise in development, urban planning, and sustainable development to create distinctive placemaking projects. Projects throughout his career have led to equitable, vibrant, diverse, and well-designed communities. He builds on his practical knowledge of development and urbanism. Hernandez's work spans the regional, city, town, and neighborhood scales and includes smart growth, transit-oriented development, neighborhood revitalization, brownhood rede brownfield redevelopment, and open space plans. Amy McBride from Tacoma, Washington, is the arts administrator for the city of Tacoma with more than 16 years experience as an arts professional. Working with the Tacoma Arts Commission, McBride manages three funding programs for arts organizations and artists, implementing public art projects, develops innovative and collaborative programming, and formulates effective policy. She's presented nationally on issues of public art, temporary art installations, and civic democracy through Americans for the Arts. She's also a sculptor. So we've had a last minute substitute as Florence Cabasa Green had to drop out at the last minute because of a personal issue. So we're glad to be joined by Tyrion Barnes from Louisville, Kentucky. Tyrion was our, what we call a lay person on our panel. So every panel at the NEA is required to have someone who's unofficially, who's not employed by the arts, but will have something great to contribute to the panel. She, she, she will bring a unique perspective to this webinar. So Tarian Barnes retired from Yum Brands in August 2011 after serving as their Chief Diversity Officer. She joined Yum Brands in, 2000, in 1998 and created the Office of Diversity. In 2010, the company was recognized by Black Enterprise Magazine as one of the 40 best companies for diversity for the sixth consecutive year. She has also served as a national resource and industry spokesperson on franchising and multicultural community affairs on CNN, The Oprah Winfrey Show, Black Entertainment Television, and other media outlets. 
She's chaired several boards, including the Kentucky African American Heritage Foundation and the Multicultural Food Service and Hospitality Alliance. She was named one of the 25 black women who have made a difference in business by Black Enterprise Magazine. She's basically done a ton of work in communities and was a great voice on many topics in the panel. So I'm gonna welcome our panelists. I think um, we're gonna get started by, the la just like we did the last time, with kind of talking about really what were some of the trends and exciting things you, that the panelists saw within um, the grants? What caught their attention about what was really happening in the country around uh, cultural planning and design? Let, Amy, let's start with you. Um, what, what caught your eye and what did you notice as you were looking, as okay, we did thanks, the review Jason. process? Um, I think the projects that were really tapping into um, other areas in their cities, like um, crossing over into working with, with social justice and um, connecting with transportation, for example, or, or the green movement and things, because I've, I've, all of our communities are ecosystems, and I thought the cultural plans that really are um, seeing themselves as part of the greater community and not something separate were really coming up with some of the more, the more uh, exciting things to me. Um, and it wasn't even, you know, it was in small towns, it was in large areas, it was, it's all over the, the nation. It's just a, a reflection of innovation. And I think when you can um, clearly articulate innovation within a cultural planning project, uh, that's A-OK -okay in my book. That's what I look for. That's great. Thank you, Daniel. Um, what what the, caught your eye? The, the projects that I thought were most interesting to me were ones that actually highlighted the quality of the urban design they were considering as part of their team and their approach. So it wasn't just sort of creating a – there was a lot of proposals that came through that created a plan, but without really a long-term vision for how, through design, they were going to attract – new markets, new people to their center of, you know, where they wanted to activate their downtown or wherever it was that they were focusing in on. That plus, I was really excited to see that people are taking more and more seriously the idea about integrating um, uh, community experts into the planning process so that there was a, uh, there was, seemed to be the projects that I was most attracted to are the ones that actually thought that in order to activate these urban places, in order to design them well, they had to hear from the community that was they had hoped would use those spaces. So those two things and, and seeing those around the country and people taking those two qualities, urban design and true civic engagement, I thought were really, really exciting to see. Um, I would say great, for me as a layperson, what was exciting is to see how art can inspire the participants to be creative and create their own art. So it was a very um, inclusive process and um, emotional as well as physical. So the, the individual who's viewing this is, is brought into the process. So I thought that was really, really exciting. That's great. Well, let's um, talk about you know, digging into the grants a little bit more. I mean, what kind of creative roles did, have you seen either in your yeah. work, and you are an Our Town grantee you know, <laughs> in the first year. You know, what kind of creative roles have you seen designers and artists playing in the cultural planning in their community? How do you, how have you engaged them? How do, you know, the grants that you thought were really successful, what were the steps they took to engage those folks? What, what did some of those processes look like? And when, when have you seen it work and not work? Let's, okay. let's dig into some of those specifics um, around that. Well, and I'm, I'm going to speak from my personal experience with the, um, how designers, I think, have, have really helped with the base level community conversation, going back to both what, what Daniel and Terry were saying about the role of people in, in these planning processes. I mean, you can build a beautiful building, but if nobody's going to use it, then we haven't succeeded. But I also think that um, the, the communication of what good design can look like, the conversations around how to get to um, connections and good, good design in communities is really important. Um, often, I know in my, my experience, let's use, you know, you go out to the community and say, oh, what do you want? And they say, oh, I want a mural of a train on the wall. Um, and it ends there, you know. So it's like that's not how to engage community in conversation about placemaking and livability. It's more about... Um, being able to have the, um, I think, designers and artists at the table to be able to encourage conversations that allow people to get to, to where 
where and how they feel about a place and what they want to feel about a place or experience a place. And I think that piece is, is essential. Um, the other thing that I think designers and artists can bring to the table if they're doing what they should be in this work is to communicate that to the next phase so that when um, either you're creating the actual plan or you're, you're applying for a grant to support your plan, you're able to convey both through language and through um, visuals um, the result of that on the ground community piece, if that makes any sense. But I, I think that translation is, is really important um, between design and art community and, and lay people and different disciplines and things like that. So Daniel, you, you've done an enormous amount of work across the country. And tell us about some times where, you, where artists were included in the process and how that maybe worked a little bit differently or how it, how, in, how it plugged into a larger planning process. I mean, several of the grants that we funded were, you know, about funding the cultural piece of a larger community plan. Well, you know, I, I, and, there um, were a few projects that, that we funded this round or, the, you know, that we, or that we advised or, you know, during the process of reviewing them that se the, pro the projects that seemed interesting sort of fell into two categories. One, that there was sort of a star sort of uh, designer, um, which created a really, really interesting approach to um, public art in that if the designer is able to actually truly involve themselves in the cultural history of place and do that well and meaningfully, then I think that you, you, know, you sort of then can work with a, a really star designer to actually help you see things that you may not have otherwise seen. And that that's actually can be an incredibly interesting process if they meaningfully engage in that cultural history of place. Um, but there are so the other the other ones that I spoke of earlier were ones where the designer actually, you know, engaged with the community to learn more through their eyes and more you know, uh, on the ground kind of learning with the current you know with the with the current dynamics of the community. Um, but I've seen that actually not play out so well, and I think I can be fairly specific about when it didn't play well, and that's when the architect actually does it from a position of not really wanting to hear what the community has to say, and they already have a preconceived idea, and they try to, and, you know, sort of push that idea onto the community that they've they've created a forum that the community came together thinking it was about something else. Um, so, um, so while the civic engagement process and the community engagement process is important in community art and public art, um, the process of actually engaging with people is is um, is is you know, the process you go through has to be truthful and meaningful. Um, the thing that seems to work best is when the artist, who unlike probably any other population of people in our society, are able to actually get people to see things in a whole new way. And that's their skill that they, you know, that's, that's their blessing to us as a society. And I think that if we as, you know, facilitators for public art can create a forum for them to be able to do that. So we have to also be, you know, the administrators and facilitators of these grants have to also be willing and nimble enough to allow the, art, the artist to do their work, which is to create something and let us see the world in a way that we may not have seen it otherwise. And so, you know, it, it goes both ways. So you have to have an artist who's willing to engage, and you have to have an administrator who's willing to actually open up the forum for those kinds of things to happen. Well, Terry, I know that you felt a lot and talked a lot about how the process is just as important as the outcomes. And I know you've done an enormous amount of work working with diverse communities on how to engage them in processes. So um, please share with us and with the country about what some of those good lessons are and what, you know, what frustrated you about people who didn't hit that in some sure. of the grants. And I what, would say one of, the, um, one of the important things is when you saw that it was done well, what did that look like? And to ask big power questions versus little power questions. So for me, Little power questions are questions like, how do we get people to be committed? How do we hold people accountable? How do we get others to buy into the vision? And how do we get that group, community group, to change? I think those kinds of questions assume that others are the problems and problems to be handled. I recommend that leaders should be asking big power questions like, what are we willing to risk to ensure we have a broad spectrum of viewpoints? What would the creative place-making process look and feel like if all facets of the community were involved? Um, questions like, are there beliefs and cultural practices among community leaders that could hinder the creative place-making process, and how can we address them? 
um, I, I found that um, there were a few that were really exciting that were asking those big questions, but too many um, were asking the little questions and viewed inclusion and diversity and community kind of as, again, something to be addressed as a one-off and not really core in the sense to the process. Thanks. Um, let's talk a little bit about community leadership. Um, what, again, we're focusing a lot right now on cultural planning. We will get into design, I think, a little bit later for those folks who are listening specifically for about topics of design. Um, I want to, want to talk a little bit more about cultural planning and the role of community leadership and, and what we saw, what you saw in the applications. You know, I'll start with Daniel here because you spoke a little bit about it already. You know, what what were you looking for from the community leadership or the people that were leading these grants to make sure that a planning process was going to go well? Well, in um, many ways, what, I learned a lot from the grantees themselves, the people who actually show? submitted really high, highly uh, professional and qualified applications. I learned a lot. And, I, and to be honest, Jason, I actually followed up a little bit with um, the design uh, or the commissioner for uh, design and construction here in New York City because looking for, and I just wanted to follow up in a conversation about that same thing, was actually the leadership that can be the steward, the longtime steward and champion of the process, not only the process, but the actual operational and programmatic issues around these uh, these projects. So particularly if there was, you know, a planning process that had to be implemented, that someone was going to be able to carry that through, that they had, they had clarity in their approach on how they were going to get from, you know, from the beginning to the end of a process. But as important, how that process led into the operational concerns for the long-term maintenance of our program around whatever they were creating. Um, so they, I wanted to hear a very uh, clear sort of almost small business plan about you know, their financing as well as the governance and stewardship of the, um, of the, of the completed product, uh, project. That's uh, Amy. Can you jump in here? I know I know you are a local leader. So, what are the kind of things that you put into projects? To, um, where where you to to make something work in the long run? I mean, I think we talked a lot about in the panel about you know what what happens after the planning process. How can we guarantee be guaranteed that this what they're planning to do will actually go through? Um, what what were the things, things you were looking for that get, made how you? Feel how more strong are, around are the that partnerships? Topic, so. You know, does it look like the partners that are at the table are really there um, doing the work? That the work is part of their their ongoing mission and not just a hey, there's a grant. Let's let's you know, hi, I haven't met you before. Can you apply for me for this thing? Doesn't it sound great? Um, a lot of the things that stuck out to me were projects that had that were building on a, a former study, or they'd you know done some legwork to show that that the feasibility was there. Um, and that made a big, big difference to me. And then, you know, depending upon who the partners are, are they the ones who, who make the most sense for a project? So if um, somebody's coming forward and, and they want to do a streetscape plan, but the public works department is nowhere to be found, or, you know, the implementers aren't, aren't at the table, then, um, you know, it's not the right mix of people. So just looking for, for that right mix. And, and I think, you know, just what everybody said so far, I think this, word works for all levels and that's is it, a, is it an authentic project does it make sense for your community um, is it aligning with the with other um, activities that are happening and leveraging the energy that's there that can propel it forward or is it trying to you know um, force a square peg in a round hole Karen, I know that you advise leaders a lot. What kind of advice do you give local well, leadership when they're, really when they're about to go in, to into one of these kind of culturally specific be planning able to processes? Raise awareness of different community leaders and people who influence different aspects of the community. So to make sure that they have the knowledge that they need to go back and catalyze their communities. So that they can, you know, you make these folks leaders in their own rights. That's how the community sees them and make them and give them the knowledge they will talk um, about what this creative place making process is like and how it's really going to be inclusive of, of their community. So engage community leaders in a meaningful way, give them the tools and the knowledge to be able to go back and lead their constituencies. And I think what Dan and Amy both said is important about being able to catalyze um, you know, excitement and to be good stewards throughout the process and not just in the beginning, the beginning phases. And obviously also to, to 
do what you can to increase your own cultural competency. Often I saw in the applications that when they talked about either people with physical uh, disabilities or differences um, or other kinds of diversity, it was just kind of putting the demographics out there and the numbers, but that's where it ended. There really wasn't uh, a demonstration that they really understood the differences and similarities in these communities. I, I, I thought that was a missed opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, let's, let's let's sort of switch to design a little bit. Um, you know, there were some exciting projects uh, that all the projects, of course, are exciting um, <laughs> that we funded. You know, there were some interesting ones that really were looking at how to rethink uh, city infrastructure and um, how to incorporate really high quality design into city infrastructure. I'm thinking of the bridges in Green Greensburg, Pennsylvania, for example, the bridges that connect the museum to the city. Um, you know, achieving design excellence within those kind of projects is, is not the easiest thing to do. Um, this is something, Amy, I know that you do in your community when you're working on public art projects and or on design projects. What, what are the steps that you take to find good designers, to work with good designers, to um, who, are the, who do you reach out to? How do you find those designers? How do you, what's the networks you use personally? Um, and then what do you have to do in the process to make sure that that designer is, right. is incorporated um, to achieve a good outcome? I know it's a big question with a lot of, you know, a lot of expertise out there in the country. Um, but for some of the folks right. that may not be as well, familiar um, as a generally with agency, the, some of these processes, I think we should talk about fit it a within, bit. You know, I, don't, I personally don't just get to go out and choose somebody up to do good design. We have to have a, a process to do selection. Um, so as, you know, maybe not so sexy as it sounds, a really good process for how you um, develop criteria for a project. Um, is really important and a consistent process that your that your um, local leaders trust. If you have an arts commission, to use them or a design commission, so that you are able to put a call out and and um, still get an end result that um, that you're proud of. Um, in the case of of our our town grant and the other one that you referred to, um, those are both associated with museums. So in this case, at least for part of our project. Um, we were able to uh, rely on the museum's authority to choose their designer, and they went through a, a process as well, but they have more curatorial um, ability than we do. So sometimes we will partner with an outside agency if we um, have the need to have a, a, a little different way to do our process. But I think um, if, you, if you don't have an arts commission or, or you're not accustomed to having a strong process for selecting artists and designers, um, I think it's essential. Even if you're applying for a grant and you don't have the designers on board, um, being able to speak to how you will select artists and designers to make sure that you have that quality is is really important. So it's tricky if you're a government agency sometimes, but um, it, it's not out, it's not impossible at all. And and actually, in receiving the Our Town grant that we did, that helped to leverage our ability to choose excellent designers for ancillary projects that are in and around that area because we have different people at the table to be part of our selection process and things like that. So it kind of raised the bar, you know, for a lot of different projects that are related. So that was awesome. That's great. Daniel, do you want to jump in here a little bit? I mean, I know that you have looked at this issue a lot with, um, obviously, if you were talking to DDC in New York, they've got a pretty innovative process there that people could look at. But, if, um, you know, for some of the smaller communities you work in, how, how, did, how do they find the good designers? So, what, you what, know, what are the uh, kind of recommendations the you make? The best way that I've seen it is to, actually just if, if, if a town or a, or, or a CDC is actually thinking about moving forward with an application and trying to find uh, good designers, starting early and, and, and interacting with local arts groups and museums um, is a really good way to just sort of understand where the network lies um, uh, around, uh, you know, artists. Typically, and not all the time, but you sort of have to keep your finger on the gauge on whether either those museums or arts groups are actually also keeping their finger on the pulse on the sort of informal network of artists in a community. And so if they're not, and if that's the kind of artist network you want to sort of send it, make sure the RFP gets circulated through, 
um, you, you want to try to find where those are. I don't have great recommendations out on where those might be found in different parts of the city, but I would just say keep your pulse on both layers and all layers of where artists are actually circulating and talking and interacting. Um, because you don't want, you don't always, I mean, it depends on what your project is or the project is, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's a little easier or there are networks where you can find sort of the uh, established designers and artists in the community, but it's not always so easy to find the more struggling artists and how you can network to get them to respond to a request for proposals for a particular project. Um, the other thing is, is that if you're designing and, in, in, you know, if you're sort of undertaking a broader master plan or redevelopment plan or a development sort of project, making that very clear with the project team that you're planning on having as part of this project team, integrating public, you know, the strategy has to be the integration of public art, making that known up front and allowing that artist to make decisions along the way with the other designers on the team is really important because designers, like um, there's a lot of people in the world, but they, they tend to be territorial with what they do. But so uh, assembling a team of people who are really interested in incorporating public art into that process and making that known up front is really important to me, uh, for the success of the project. Thanks. Well, I'd like to jump a little bit into the design of facilities. You know, we funded several different kinds of facilities, and unfortunately, one of our experts um, who uh, could talk a lot about cultural facilities, Florence, couldn't be on the phone with us today. But I do think we need to talk about the topic a little bit. You know, there was a major study released recently um, by the University of Chicago about um, the overbuilding of some facilities. Um, we just we still did fund quite a bit of facility projects uh, in this pool. Um, you know, something that I you said to all the panel said to all the panelists was you know there needs to be we need to see evidence that there's someone who's actually going to run this thing and um, that they have a plan for sustaining it if they're planning on doing a facility plan but I'd love to hear if you want to jump in again here Daniel about what when you were looking at some of the facility projects what made one stand out over another you know I mean I, I think yeah. we should talk specifically first about some of the cultural facility ones and then I think artist space is kind of a different topic that I'll ask other folks to jump in on, um, but what, 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 to you made assured so you? That's a great that question, we Jason. And actually, just to kind of give a little bit of background about the, the question and my ability to answer it, it's some 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 knowledge. Um, we do a lot of facilities planning um, for cultural and educational institutions in our office, and what we're always concerned about, even before they even walk through the door with us, is whether they actually have a very strong board. And a, uh, and, and a sort of track record of understanding the direct correlation between their programming desires and where they've been and where they're going um, before they actually start planning the facility itself. So oftentimes, uh, and, and, the op and the operational costs associated with that. So oftentimes the, the cultural facility focuses either most, oh, typically when they get into this process, they're really excited about creating a new facility without understanding the programmatic and operational costs associated with that. So we were looking for organizations who had a very strong understanding um, and, uh, about that association that if you're increasing your program, there are operational costs associated with that. And we wanted to feel that the organization understood that and had the capacity to increase their operational uh, uh, revenues um, from whatever resources they, they had um, uh, so that it matched their increased growth in facility expansion. Um, so we were really, really, really focused on that, I think. Of course, we were, you know, we were focused on the architecture and design team that were, that were designing these facilities, but we wanted to make sure that they weren't overstepping what their capacity as an organization could handle. That's great. Amy, do you want to jump in Jason? here? Sorry, I muted myself. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think Daniel covered it really Amy. well. Um, but also, you know, there's the facility itself, but also <laughs> what, what is its place within the broader community? Is it, um, you know, standing alone somewhere being a nice facility or is it connected to the greater community and can it, can it also contribute to catalyzing um, activity and, and other things that happen around it? I think that's really important too.
Great. Well, I want so if folks want to, we have about five, seven more minutes uh, before we're going to jump into some questions from the crowd. So if people want to go ahead and start typing some questions into Q and A, um, we can uh, start answering some of those in a few minutes. But I wanted to, before we jumped into um, this question, I wanted to talk a little bit more, bit more about design and about um, there's a couple projects we have here, like the one in San Antonio and the one in Orlando, where there was a real connection between the planning and design of the place and transit. And um, uh, you know, specifically, I wanted Amy to jump in here a little bit and talk about you know what's it like for a community to think about the role of um, you know design excellence and the arts within. Um, transit projects and kind of how have you done that from your end? Right. How well, have you have involved, a, been involved a transit in those kinds of projects called Sound Transit in, in our city, region? Being a government employee, um, and they actually built their their first 1.9 mile light link rail light light rail link before they um, continued on with many more miles in Seattle. Sorry, they, they actually came into our com community when our um, we had no percent for art funding. It had been killed in the 80s, Hello? and they were instrumental in, in working oh, with sorry, us to start to um, talk about art again and to get art in places where people wouldn't necessarily ex um, expect it. And um, they did beautiful stations, each with their own unique um, artworks and, and a variety of artists who participated in that. Because, I mean, transit is, is a long-term investment and an investment into the future, and it's um, very much about about place making. You have people that are going to be purposefully spending their time hanging around, um, waiting for whatever um, transit mobility is going to come your way. And I think it's an excellent opportunity to to help tell the story of a community and to and to contribute to that place making. And I I think um, you know it's a great way to involve uh, even emerging artists um, if they're partnered with an agency that can help provide them the, the skills and maybe some support to get them to be able to do a, a project in the public realm if they haven't done it before. I think it's a great opportunity to help that and to get some, some fresh fresh work out there. Um, but I, I think that I think when you're traveling, that's one of the best times to be quiet and even experience the world around you in a different way. And so I think art is, a, is an essential piece to, to transit projects. And I'm, I was excited to see that other people are are considering that. Okay, we're going to jump into some questions from the crowd. Um, here's one specifically for Tarian. Uh, we are working um, on a cultural planning project that's uh, in a mostly Hispanic based, um, mostly Hispanic populated, excuse me, neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, what recommendations do you have to work with? Uh, what, what this is a general uh, question about what, what tools would you the, recommend the, um, specifically for working uh, within that, that particular know, when community? When you're looking at language translation, go beyond the words and to the emotions and meanings behind them. So make sure you're connecting. Um, too many people when they're dealing with the Hispanic community get caught up in the language uh, differences initially, but th I think the cultural rich differences are much richer and, and a place to concentrate, and understand. Um, what their culture is about and how it fits in with the cultural, you know, uh, creative placemaking process. Um, and then also obviously tap into the leaders in the community who are influencers, influencers with the Hispanic uh, population. Um, and I think then in looking at partnerships, of course there has to be a nonprofit and a local government entity. Look at your partner and what they bring to the table in terms of really um, reaching out to that community. So don't take it all on a loan, put some of that on the partner. That's great, thank you. Um, here's a question. Uh, where's a uh, mid-sized American community who's interested in doing, uh, working on our cultural district and, and looking at the beginning of doing their cultural district planning. What recommendations do you have? <laughs> That's uh, great. Daniel, this, yes. Um, um, to begin that process. Definitely do um, um, asset do mapping first. Asset I'm mapping assuming first. also that you've organized sort of the stakeholders well so that they're actually helping you through that process about identifying what the assets are from their perspective. 
Um, but that's that's a great. So when I'm typically embarking on a cultural district plan or a master plan a redevelopment district or whatever, you know, I, I really make sure that I've outlined the entire process from beginning to end and where the civic engagement process comes in strategically. Um, at those, I do it in three different phases, but, you know, sort of this early phase is that asset map, mapping, the second phase is sort of designing and coming up with your ideas. Um, and, and then the last phase is synthesizing all ideas, and you sort of bring the community into those different phases. But um, that definitely that first phase is gather as much information as you can um, from every point of view that you think is important to you, but also to the team, and then also to who you think the stakeholders and what their concerns are going to be. So when you get to the design phase, you have all of that in your back pocket, ready to respond, ready to actually use it to begin designing your, your plan. Um, so it sounds like you're on track if you if, if you ask that question. Yeah, I think um, that asset map mapping is an important piece, but I think it it's to be done you know, to get the information to decide what kind of plan makes the best sense for your community. So it's not, oh. Um, that we should do a cultural plan, you know, <laughs> well, why, you know, what's, what's the point, what are you hoping to get out of it, how is it going to meet the needs of your community, how can it leverage what you have that's, that's positive that's going on, are there certain gaps that you're trying to fill, and, and are there certain things that, that the cultural piece can fit better maybe than some other, that some, than some other things, but not trying to be the solution for all things at all times. Um, I think being able to be knowledgeable and able to make connections and have the have the best synergy possible is is crucial for cultural planning you know it, you know, it, I don't know we always hear that oh another plan that's going to sit on the shelf well what, what keeps plans from sitting on the shelf it's, it's about the energy behind them and the the people participating in it and and actually being able to move on some things to show some success I mean it is a long process but I think even when you're putting it down on paper to really think about where you can actually start to show some, some impact is, is really helpful. Um, here's another question. This is probably one that I'll ask Terry and to jump in a little bit on, but keeping in mind the challenges of cultural integration in some communities, have you uh, observed effective collaborative community arts development projects that have been employed in the U.S. that it's have increased question. community in, collective, in, um, collectivity and diverse Canada, immigrant communities. There were a couple of examples that really, really stood out. Unfortunately, right now on this call, I cannot remember. Maybe Daniel or Amy can remember some of those specifically. But if there's a way to that I can follow up after this call or get back to that person, I'd love to. Sure. Daniel or Amy, do you want to jump in here? Any examples where you've seen really the immigrant community being the target of, of, of some of this work, target uh, being the Well, again, this was um, actually in, in um, art, activity public arts the, projects the I did in San Francisco that, were actually um, about bringing uh, immigrant communities into the discussion. And so when I talked earlier about working with CDCs um, or arts groups or arts museums, it was always focused on whether that was the Latino uh, sort of at CDC in the area that was actually doing the various types of projects. And I was trying to identify artists that would be able to work on an architecture team to be able to actually, you know, integrate public art into um, affordable housing developments where it was clear that the immigrant communities needed affordable housing and it was a way to actually then in, engage them in, in other sort of, in, if you will, infrastructural assets of the community like affordable, qual high quality affordable housing that integrated art that represented their own aspirations as a community. So it was a great way to kind of combine and create a synthesis about these different things um, in community development, community building. That's a, uh, one that I, I know I'm going to hang up and be like, oh, and then there was this and then there was that, but one that jumps to mind that I remember um, standing out was in, in Boise, Idaho. They they have a uh, strong Basque community, and I remember that they did a number of projects to celebrate, you know, engage the Basque artists in their traditional art forms and create, you know, a place around around that, which, you know, I remember it. It certainly had some success 
as a result of that, but Yeah, there's an interesting project I just heard about, too, just to jump in a little bit here. Um, the Boston Foundation is actually, so there's 140 different communities in the city of Boston. And one of the things that they're doing is they're going to fund what's called random acts of culture, uh, support for temporary events um, in the city. And they'll only fund, uh, they want to get to all 140. So if you've already done work in the El Salvador community, you can't come in. but um, what they're going to do is do some very deep work with this, the way that Tarion spoke about it, working with a lot of those community That's leaders awesome. to identify those kind of projects in each of those communities and putting a little bit of funding behind it. So that might be an interesting project for you to look at also. Um, here's one for, for Amy. Um, what kind of innovative partnerships have you witnessed in the design of cultural facilities or sort of the public spaces around cultural facilities? And I know you're working on one um, of those in Tacoma right now. Well, so what, what are the partnerships I'm, that I'm you have I seen that what have really made What did you say really earlier? That, was special? it in Milwaukee where the ballet partnered with the science? That blew my – yeah. So that was, that blew me away because it was, it was such disparate fields right, coming yeah. together. But, the you know, Harmony Initiative, yeah. When somebody can stitch together a project like project like that, and it makes sense, like oh, of course, you know that there would be a connection between the um, the the sports science and the and dance. Um, trying to think of some other ones. I mean, our partnership is with the museum, which is which is a great partnership, but it it's not atypical. Um, ask Daniel. Let me think about this for a second. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, that, yeah, that that was an int a very interesting set of partners, the one in, in Milwaukee. Um, well, uh, I am going to ask you guys each to give us some final comments here before we wrap up in the next five minutes or so. Um, but I want to ask one more question uh, that just came in. Um, so, uh, this is a question really about, again, about achieving design excellence and, and what you guys were looking for um, in the grants and how. So this is a question that um, they're basically asking, you know, how, do, how do folks find the kind of designers or artists um, that might meet the um, the kind of excellence require requirements of the NEA, and I, I, you know one thing I'll say is that you know in the if you read the guidelines of the Our Town guidelines, we are looking for excellence that's appropriate to the place um, and authentic to that place. So we're not expecting that everybody will fly in Frank Gehry to design an astronomically expensive building. That's certainly not what the panel was looking for. But so if you could speak a little bit more, and I might ask Amy to jump in again here about how. If an artist wasn't identified, what kind of process were you looking for that would guarantee um, in the grant that 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 you feel comfortable that okay. they were going to achieve, achieve um, the excellence requirement? I mean, well, what, what I mentioned were earlier, I think process, about um, developing the parameters for the project. So I think maybe it even starts there. So when you're identifying what you want the artist to do, um, that helps really define. Uh, the quality of the project or the innovation of the project. So if it's a um, kind of off the shelf, I've, saw, I've seen 10 communities do decorate a, a pig and we're going to do a decorate the pig thing and then we're going to have the process be X, Y, Z. From the get-go, I think that kind of fails on the artistic excellence level because it's the project itself is kind of standard. Um, but if it's like, I remember, trying to think of the projects that we saw, but you know, if you're looking at, um, as Daniel mentioned earlier, engaging artists either early on so that you know, we can see that um, you understand that the role of the artist can be more than just being the one that, that decorates the corner with the sculpture, um, that could be interesting if you've identified um, different opportunities, be they temporary or um, ways that artists can engage space or things like that that help um, show that there are different ways that artists can be involved, that would be good. And if you're even looking to do a, a traditional a traditional piece, um, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's just really clarifying what you're looking for up front. And then um, a typical process is that you, you define your parameters, your call to artists, what are you looking for? Um, 
you ask them to submit examples of their work, and you ask them to submit your, your, their resume and, and a letter of interest, and they should be able to respond to your project. So your call to, your call to artists is your, your job description, basically. And they, they should be able to speak to you about how they perceive your site and how excited they are about you know, whatever it is you have going on and how they'd, they'd do a good job for you. And then I think the, the next most important piece is pulling together the selection panel, because that's the place where you get to have um, varying levels of engagement. And, and expertise. So on our panels, we have um, you know, arts professionals, artists, curators, but we also have community members and stakeholders that are, that are um, going to be using the place or, or being affected by the place. So it's not just uh, you know, only art people who get to decide, because it's about community as well. But I think having that mix in the room, um, I, I never fail to, ha to see the panelists have a really um, robust conversation, and there's a lot of um, information exchange, and and um, I've seen some just phenomenal selections come out of that. Um, you also got to remember that you get to interview your people. So you after you you look at all the slides and you make your your finalists, um, you bring them in and you talk to them so that you're you're sure that you're getting the artistic quality you want, but you're also getting an artist with whom you believe your community can work with and who who gets you, you know, so that you can. Um, go through the trials and tribulations of public art, which which is not a straight line, um, and be working with somebody who 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 does a good job. And you know, if if it's a, a pretty a big budget project, you know, you're going to be looking for artists with with a deeper breadth of experience. If you're looking for um, more temporary works, you might have the opportunity to work with artists who haven't worked in the public realm as much. Um, so depending upon what your project is. Um, you, you set it out with that call, but you always have the process where you're, you're looking at the work coming in. And I think um, Daniel's comment earlier about making sure that you're casting the net wide and, and getting you know, not just the people that are on your mailing list, but figuring out how to connect with, with artists who may not know how to look there. I mean, this is a different kind of thing, but we were doing a, a mural program, and we wanted to connect with some of the urban graffiti-style artists out there. And we um, found a way to partner with a private garage to allow free free wall painting, which was an entree into that community, a very non-traditional one. But it was a way for us to start to, to have something out there that connected with, with those artists that we wanted to find and, and be able to, to connect with other opportunities later. So that's kind of an aside, but yeah. Right, that's because I am one. Great, thanks. <laughs> that's great. Right. I mean, I would also add, of course, that um, you should always look to your local arts agency. Amy is a local arts agency person, and uh, and uh, um, uh, and uh, your state arts agencies um, as resources for finding artists. But uh, Daniel, before we jump into final words, I want you to say a little bit about um, procuring and finding good cultural planners and designers. Um, it is a little bit of a different process than finding an artist for a piece of public art. You know, what do you say when somebody calls you up and says, gosh, we've got, we're going to do this cultural district plan. Um, you know, what's the best way for me to, to get the word out? Well, and find, they, so, um, I mean, you know, thankfully we have the internet me, where you can actually do, do tons this kind of, work. What, of what looking kind of at previous folks, work, uh, design work and award-winning work that's happened around the country, and whether it's a master plan or whether it's a cultural plan, and just do a little bit of work to find out what's happening in the world, to find out what the cutting edge things are that are happening. And I, I, I actually really, really, whether it's a public procurement requirement or not to actually do an RFP process, I, if, if there are stakeholders involved in that process, it's a really valuable thing to actually, one, identify what those big best practice you know, deliverables have been in other places. Show them to the other people who will be involved in the decision. This is the quality. This is the kind of stuff that this group should aspire to, and this is where we're heading. And write an aspirational RFP to get people to actually respond at a, at a level 
um, that you want that meets those kind of best practices that you saw and that you've introduced to the people who will be making the decisions. It's just, it, I, I, I can't, you know, that visual quality, you can go on all day about, oh, we really want high quality and we really want beautiful design, but until people are actually able to see what that means through photos of best practices from other places, then you can begin sort of bringing them in closer so they make the right decision to get a high quality designer on your team. Uh, so that, uh, that's what I would recommend people doing. Okay, great. Um, and I won't, we won't get into a conversation about design competitions at this point. That's probably be something we'll hold uh, for a, a future webinar um, that the design team might do at some point. Uh, but that is, Another option that some, some cultural facilities and some folks look at, there were none of those actually in these grants, but big topic that we're not going to try to jump into right now. Um, we, have a, we have five more minutes to jump into um, final comments from folks. I just uh, you know, wanted to get some final words from all three of you about what kind of advice you would have for folk communities that are really trying to pursue the kinds of projects that you guys reviewed. Um, any, any final thoughts for these folks as they might apply next year? We imagine that these webinars will be listened to quite a bit by folks that might um, okay. look at coming in next year. So what's, you said an enormous amount, but are there, are there any last thoughts you want to get in before we have to jump off the phone here? Tarion? Um, congratulations to everyone that submitted an application. There was a tremendous Please amount of work that went into this one, bit, and it was an honor to, re to review them, to work with Jason and his team, and to work with the fellow panelists. Final words, play to your unique strengths. That's where your energy and zest come through in the application, and then show where you're, what you're doing to continue to build your know-how in other areas and select, selecting your partner, but play to your strengths. Um. I think I would I would second that, you know, make sure that Great. what you're Thank writing you. is authentic, but have somebody read your application. I mean, this is very, you know, it, it's fantastic to have a great idea, but if you can't communicate it, um, it we have, the panels have so much to read through. It, it The more clear you can be and the more um, just sort of, um, yeah, clear is the word, is <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> what I'm not doing now. Um, and just have somebody look at it, have somebody read it for that, and um, keep thinking good things and doing, you know, do do authentic work in your community, and then just figure out how to communicate it. Yeah. So I think that it's um, it's really important to organize ahead of time. These applications take a long Daniel, time word. to put together and it really, if you're going to bring together a group of people and excite them about the potential to get federal funding, um, you want to make sure that you've actually spent a lot of time in planning it, getting agreement, um, and, and sort of writing a very high quality application. But as the previous comments were, be extremely clear about what you're doing and what the outcomes are. Um, we, there were a lot of applications and the ones that always rose to the top that we remembered after reading them and we sat around the table to discuss them for a few days. The ones that rose to the top were had a clear message about what, what you were going to do, who was going to be involved, the diversity of people that were going to be involved, and what the outcome was and, and the benefits of those outcomes. Um, so, uh, just planning ahead and, and, and making sure that you have agreement on a strategy, I think, is really important. That was awesome. Thank you, all three of you. Um, so thanks so much to our panelists and all the attendees, attendees that are on the phone. Again, this will be archived. Um, on our website in the next few days. Uh, I just want to close by saying it is an exciting time for the evolution and exploration in the creative placemaking field. I'm pretty certain our investments, um, uh, with the help of our expert panelists, uh, they've really guided us to projects that will bear fruit for their communities and lessons for the field as a whole, and we look forward to continuing to share those lessons. So thanks so much, everyone, for coming, you. and we will uh, you, see you again next Tuesday. Thanks,